Well, I just want to say another big good morning to um, everyone who is joining us here in person at Loma Linda University for our seventh annual Adventist Bioethics Conference, uh, as well as to give a warm welcome to those who are many of you who are joining us online as well uh, from all over the nation. And uh, here to welcome us is Dr. Leo Renslin, uh, the Dean of the School of Religion. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Again, as Dr. Ma just said, welcome to the 2023 conference of the Adventist Bioethics Consortium. We're just delighted that you've come to Loma Linda University to explore and examine the challenging ethical issues that we all face today. Just thrilled to have you come. And I just, if you don't mind, just giving a shout out to three of you that used to be part of our wonderful School of Religion that have returned, and that is Carla Gober, Andy Lampkin, and Mark Carr. So glad that you three are here with us. <laughs> Welcome back home. You know, we have planned an impressive conference program for you. And over the course of this conference, we will be hearing from a range of experts in the field of bioethics, as well as members from our own Adventist community who have personal experience with these bioethical issues. And you know, we believe that by coming together in this way, we can create a space for meaningful dialogue and work towards solutions that reflect our shared Adventist theological vision and shared commitment to compassion, to justice, and respect for human life. And as we begin, we simply must give thanks to Dr. Grace Wee and Dr. Yi Shen Ma for the enormous amount of work that they put in in planning this conference. Thank you both. Thank you, Ben. And we also need to thank our member uh, organizations for their steadfast support of the Admis Bioethics Consortium, which many of you here represent those institutions. And thank you for your support. As we begin this conference, let's reflect on what the psalmist invites us to celebrate this morning about the goodness of God. He says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all the generations. And so again, on behalf of the Center for Christian Bioethics, we welcome each of you to the, to the 2023 conference at Loma Linda University. Thank you for coming. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we live in a complex world full of challenging ethical issues facing our society and healthcare systems. We ask for your presence and guidance as we seek to discern your will and your wisdom in the presentations of our panelists and speakers. We ask that you also bless our time together so that we may emerge from this conference with a deeper understanding of the ethical challenges that we all face and a renewed commitment to embrace our Adventist theological vision, working for justice, compassion, and healing in the world. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And now I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished speaker for our devotional this morning, Dr. Eric Carter. Dr. Eric Carter is a dual citizen of the United States and Norway. He received degrees in theology and religion from Southern Adventist University and Andrews University, as well as a D-men from Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. His PhD is from Claremont School of Theology. Dr. Carter is an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and has served as a pastor in various districts throughout the Kentucky-Tennessee Conference. In addition to pastoral ministry, he also has significant experience in pastoral care and counseling and holds a clinical membership in the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education. By serving in these ways, he has worked with churches, with hospitals, with agencies, with families and couples, and individuals seeking healing and wholeness. In 2014, Dr. Carter was invited to join the faculty of the School of Religion, teaching in the area of practical theology. He has a deep concern for the faithfulness of the church and speaks regularly around the country 
and abroad on matters of theological and spiritual renewal. His publications can be found in various professional and church-related journals. Dr. Carter is married to Dr. Harmony Carter, a pediatric physician at Loma Linda University Medical Center. Together, they have two kids. His personal interests include spending time with family, ultralight backpacking, and you need to ask him about this one, body surfing, traveling, and the creative arts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Carter. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Ranzlin, for those kind words of introduction. Our theme for the conference this year is Highways and Hedges, the Ethics of Solidarity. Now, this phrase, highways and hedges, um, this comes from a story, a well-known story that Jesus told uh, in the New Testament. And so I thought that it would be entirely appropriate uh, for our time of, uh, of worship, of devotion this morning, as well as tomorrow, to just kind of linger there with that story and with the events surrounding that story. So if you have access to a Bible uh, on your phone or tablet, um, perhaps a computer, I'd like to, uh, to invite you to join me as I read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Gospel of Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to begin with verse 1. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. And so he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place. So that when the one who's invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he also went on to say to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. No, when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, Okay, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. 
But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife. And for that reason, I cannot come. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his servant, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, master, what you have commanded has been done. And still there's room. And the master said to the servant, go out then into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that your word will be our rule, that your spirit, our teacher, and that your greater glory will be our utmost concern. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Life is full of surprises, isn't it? History is replete with examples of how this is so, especially biblical history. The prophet Samuel had no clue who the next king of Israel should be as he saw Jesse parade each of his sons before him. In fact, after the last son was brought forth, Samuel asked, is there anyone else? And Jesse kind of scratched his head, I can imagine, and said, racking his brain. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> there's David, but he's just watching the sheep. You see, even David's father didn't really think much of his son, David, and his potential as Israel's next leader. But God did. For the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. Because I have rejected him. For God does not see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? At the heart. Big surprise for Samuel. Big surprise for Jesse. Life is full of surprises. And according to Jesus, so is eternal life. And who's going to be there? In Luke 14, we find Jesus in the midst of, well, Let's just call it a crucial conversation. I'd like to zoom in on a critical moment in the course of events that evening, linger there for a bit, then pan out and relate a couple of key lessons from the narrative as a whole. First, let's zoom in. The scene takes place at a leader of the Pharisee's home, and the occasion is a Sabbath dinner. If you'll recall, Jesus first foils a plot to entrap him, counsels guests regarding their table manners, then instructs the host about true hospitality. And what we're left with, well, maybe I'm reading into the text a little bit here, but, you know, sanctified imagination and all. (laughs) There is an awkward silence. It's an awkward silence. Finally, one of the guests just couldn't take it anymore and broke that silence with a very common toast made at dinner gatherings such as this, recall in the text, as I was just reading it a moment ago, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. I can almost hear the guests exhaling a sigh of relief. (laughs) Amen. Amen. I could, I could just see them all sort of sitting around, nodding their heads as they look smugly around the room. And, but here's the thing. Jesus couldn't agree more. Finally, something they all could agree upon at this dinner event. I can see Jesus joining in the joy of what that day will be like to eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob around the table. And Jesus then proceeds by relating this parable from whence we get our theme 
the language of the highways and hedges. It's also known as the Messianic Banquet, the parable of the Messianic Banquet. It is a parable about that final meal of the righteous at the end of the age. We call that place heaven. In essence, Jesus' response to all of these religious leaders at the party was this. Yes, the Messianic Banquet, it's going to be a grand event. It's going to be incredible dinner. Everything has been prepared. Too bad you're not going to be there. Surprise. The response must have been as incredulous as Jesus' disciples when they heard how hard it was for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But in this case, it's the poor and the sick that will be eating bread at the Messianic banquet and not them. It was like pulling the rug out from underneath them. Whatever all they had been depending on was now deemed irrelevant by Jesus. So what's going on here? In this subversive parable, Jesus surveys the scene and seeks to answer the all-important question. Who? Who will enjoy divine hospitality at the Messianic banquet at the end of the age? Who? The answer Jesus provides is is quite simple, really. It's those who, one, accept God's invitation to join him at the table. And two, imitates his hospitality ethics as host to the poor and outcast. Our task this morning is to consider the first of these, accepting Jesus' invitation to join him as a guest at the table. But accepting the invitation is um, evidently not as straightforward as you may think. According to Jesus, there are maybe some big surprises in store for us. For it's possible to lose your place on the guest list. The invitation to join him at the Messianic banquet is for all, no doubt. The invitation goes out to everyone. But it's possible to decline the invitation. From this passage of scripture, we learn there are at least two obstacles to accepting the invitation. We can decline that invitation when we show, one, a disregard for godly humility, when we show a disregard for godly humility, and two, when we show a disregard for the eternal summons, the eternal summons. So let's pan out now and unpack these two critical lessons. To remain on the guest list, we must overcome a disregard for godly humility. Uh, Clearly, this Sabbath dinner wasn't going as planned. (laughs) As the evening ambled on, Jesus noticed the guests fighting for position of honor around the table and among themselves. In verse 7, Luke says, Jesus began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor around the table. Addressing this through a story, Jesus offered wise counsel about the insidious nature of pursuing status and honor and how quickly you can lose it. Moreover, in God's kingdom, Jesus declares these things ought not to be for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, the interesting thing here is the Pharisees, (laughs) they were very much aware of this spiritual reality. As teachers of the law, they certainly knew stories like Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron who thought they could approach God in whatever manner they saw fit because of their status, their proximity to the high priest, only to fatally realize they couldn't have been more wrong. Talk about a surprise, especially to all of God's people at that time. These brothers were certainly voted most likely to succeed in religious leadership among their peers. I was not voted that in high school, by the way, just in case you're wondering. So why did these leaders not see the issues they were acting out, but instead attributed meaning to prestige and power instead? They didn't see it because they had no need to see it. They were sadly blinded to their own spiritual condition. 
No progress can be made, and mark my words, no progress can be made in the spiritual life without first recognizing your need. The guests at this dinner didn't need anything, or so they thought. They had it all, education, knowledge, the job, success, money, stuff, and the social standing that comes from all of that. These leaders were trapped in their own confirmation bias, we might say, which says, because you have all these things, it's evidence that God has blessed you. You found favor with God. You're on the right path. Therefore, what need do they have of faith in this Jesus, the Messiah? Conversely, if you're sick and disabled, if you're an outcast, you're under the finger of God. Under the curse of God, you must have done something to deserve your plight in life. And when you're disabled, you can't work. And when you can't work, you can't support your family. And before you know it, you're the one living along the highways and the hedges. The reality is that every one of those guests that night was only a moment away from losing it all themselves, from being disabled themselves. From losing it all due to a constellation of circumstances, and they didn't even realize it. Any one of them could have suffered a heart attack or a stroke, contracted cancer or leprosy, or heaven forbid, suffer the loss of a spouse or a child. Any one of them could have lost his position and standing in society in the blink of an eye. Such was the case for Elizabeth Holmes. You recognize that name. You remember that name. Elizabeth Holmes, an American inventor and entrepreneur, became the youngest self-made female billionaire in 2015 after her healthcare technology company, Theranos, reached $9 billion, $9 billion in valuation and made a hefty profit. Holmes became an instant celebrity with her name on Time's 100 Most Influential People of 2015. But her time as a billionaire was cut short as federal investigations loomed over her company with allegations of potentially misleading its investors about their new innovative blood testing technology. You remember her now, maybe? (laughs) I think Law & Order did an episode on her, actually. (laughs) Following these allegations, her credibility and personal worth both took a serious hit. Forbes devalued her personal wealth to zero. And Fortune magazine, oh my goodness, titled Holmes as one of the world's most disappointing leaders. I wouldn't want to be on that list. The blink of an eye. In order to remain on the guest list to this messianic banquet, we must not show a disregard for godly humility. We must recognize our need and live into humility. But there's another obstacle we see in this story, and that is a disregard for the eternal summons. A disregard for the eternal summons. To remain on the guest list, we must overcome a disregard for the eternal summons. Notice what Jesus says in the parable of the Messianic banquet. And at the dinner hour, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Consider me excused. Another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife and for that reason, I cannot come. These are preposterous excuses. They're absolutely ridiculous when you think about it. As you see, Jesus loved the poor, but he also loved the rich and he loved the privileged. This parable, I believe, marks a departure in Jesus' approach in trying to reach the leadership class. All that transpired at this dinner party, the reason Jesus accepted the invitation to this Pharisee's home on Sabbath in the first place, was his hope to reach them with the truth of the gospel for their lives. 
and he tried everything he could to do so. Miraculous healings, teaching, and most of all, his own welcoming presence as the word became flesh and dwelt among them. Yet, they declined the invitation. All they had were excuses. The specifics are somewhat inconsequential as they all point to disordered desires. All the excuses betray a preoccupied mind. To these intended guests, other interests had become all-absorbing. So what's Jesus to do? You have to do something to disrupt the status quo. You have to do something to arrest their attention. The little book of Jude suggests two approaches to reaching people with the gospel. In verses 22 and 23, we read, Of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Both of these approaches are legitimate and are representative of the dynamic the dynamics of God's love for his creation. I think we would be wise to keep this in mind, for they balance God's mercy and his justice. By pointing to the final ward at the resurrection of the righteous, in verse 14, Jesus hoped to get those in the leadership class to consider their lives in light of eternity, hence the eternal summons, to see their need. There is indeed a heaven to win and a hell to shun, and Jesus spoke quite a lot about both. Surprisingly, a lot of material on both of them. So Jesus was trying to draw a connection here between this world and the next. He said to these leaders at this dinner, it was their antics and behavior on display that particular evening that eventually would exclude them from the final messianic banquet. If the love of God is not appreciated and does not become an abiding principle to soften and subdue the soul, we are utterly lost. The Lord can give no greater manifestation of his love than he has given. If the love of Jesus does not subdue the heart, there are by no means which we can be reached. God's great invitation to join him at the final banquet, to enter into a lifelong companionship with the God of the universe, stands as an open invitation. Come, for everything is ready. So let's return to our question. Who will enjoy divine hospitality at the Messianic banquet at the end of the age? The answer Jesus provides, first and foremost, are those who accept God's invitation to join him at the table. Seems simple enough, doesn't it? Apparently not, which is why there are some big surprises in store. The invitation to join God at the banquet is made to all, but only the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind are the ones who responded. Why is that? Jesus welcomes everyone and is at home with all people, indeed. But evidently not everyone feels at home with Jesus. To be at home with Jesus, you have to overcome any disregard for true godly humility. You have to recognize your need. You also have to prioritize a relationship with him, not making excuses to do so. So what does this mean for us? Let's bring this to a conclusion. While there are two classes of people portrayed in the events of this evening dinner, Jesus was primarily speaking to the leaders of Israel. But the events that transpired that evening must not be confined to yesteryear, for they are still the same obstacles for us today. Are we not beset with the same series of challenges in accepting this grand invitation to the Messianic banquet? Are we not also leaders? As leaders, if we truly examine our own lives, are we manifesting an attitude of service? Are we servant leaders or are we self-serving leaders? seeking to be at the head of the table, driven by power, prestige, and profit. And we'll do anything to obtain it and ensure we don't lose it. Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Anyone familiar with, with that one? It's a classic in business leadership literature. When I read this book, 
I was struck by Collins's initial determination to not produce yet another book about leadership. However, after 15,000 hours of empirical research and data analysis, he and his team could not deny their findings. Leadership was the determining factor in business performance. But not just any type of leader. What moved a business from the good to the great category was undeniably a very specific kind of leader. He calls them level five leaders, and above all, what set them apart was this, humility. They display a compelling modesty, these level five leaders. They are self-effacing and understated, Collins writes. They attribute success to factors other than themselves, but take full personal responsibility when things go wrong. In Christian parlance, we call these people servant leaders. And uh, Collins was reluctant to use that kind of language and to talk about humility, but he had to, he had to relate his findings. Because you see, these aren't the qualities that most people aspire to. This is not the profile of the kind of leader that takes a business from the good to the great category. Right? We have an entirely different picture of a charismatic kind of person, right? But by the force of their personality, is able to shape and move and convince people. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. To go to good to great requires humility. It's a totally different kind of leader, and it empirically verifies what Jesus has been saying the whole time. It's not your position or accomplishment that gives you a place at the Messianic banquet. It's how you hold that position. It's whether your character can support the position as a type of mold scaffolding. So many leadership problems occur in the church and in our institutions that are a direct result of power outpacing character. Oh, that one touched it. That one touched a nerve. Yeah. I'm glad to know that you're still listening. <laughs> in our parable, Jesus gives a most magnanimous invitation. Come, for everything is ready now. How do we accept the invitation? Well, we go to God and we say, I admit it. I admit that I don't like my condition. Even though I've worked hard to get to where I am, I've arrived. I've made it. I have it all. But something is still missing. And that's you. That's you, Lord. You are the only one who can truly meet me in my deepest needs. And I want to enjoy your company at the final banquet. If you accept the invitation, prioritize your life on me, Christ says. In doing so, you will find true blessing and be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's good news. Will you believe it? Will you accept it? Will you accept the invitation? Come, for everything is ready now. Let's pray. God, help us so that we don't get upset when we're wounded with spiritual conviction, that we don't get hard when the plow goes through, but that the seed of the gospel might find lodgment so that we remain on the guest list and accept your invitation. Come, everything is ready now. Amen.